Turn in your Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 2. Matthew, chapter 2, in your Bibles this evening. We're continuing our series of messages on the names of Jesus, and tonight we find a very important name that identifies our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Find your place. Would you join in as we stand in reverence uh, the word of the Lord this evening? Matthew chapter number two. And I'll read one verse of scripture, and it's the last verse of the chapter. Matthew chapter two and verse number 23. And it came, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Tonight, I want to talk to us about that verse and that word, Nazarene. Jesus, the Bible said, shall be called a Nazarene. Now, there's a lot behind that, and I want to share it with us tonight, Lord willing, for just a few moments. Father, thank you tonight for each one present. I pray you'll bless us around the Word of God for the next few minutes. And bless each one that's come. Bless the message tonight. Speak to our hearts. And thank you, Lord, for all of the prayers that's already been offered up. And I pray and join others for all the special requests tonight. There were so many. You know each desire, you know what's behind each upraised hand and each request that's been made known this evening. We sure ask for your intervention. We ask for your touch. And uh, Lord, just have your will and your way now in this service with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit as he enables us to do that. We believe you've called us to do and we'll thank you for it because we ask this in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. Thank you. As you study the Bible, one of the most common names of the Lord Jesus in the Scriptures was Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus the Nazarene. Now, I want to talk to you, first of all, about Jesus and Nazareth. Now, if you know anything about your Bibles tonight, this is an important town because this is where Jesus spent most of his life. Nazareth was the city of Mary and Joseph. They lived there. And in the life of Christ, as it's set forth in the New Testament, he is born in Bethlehem, and then they leave Bethlehem and they go down into Egypt. And then out of Egypt, they come back to Nazareth. Now, the distance from Bethlehem to Nazareth is uh, or somewhere around 200 miles, uh, two hours over two-hour journey. So here's the town where Jesus was well known. Now, you know and I know what he was doing there. The Bible on several occasions reminds us that as he lived in the city of Nazareth, he was a carpenter by trade because Joseph was a carpenter. I'm sure that Jesus was well known in the city of Nazareth because we're told by archaeologists and historians that at that time Nazareth was a very small town. It was not heavily populated, but it was a place where Jesus spent approximately 30 years of his life. Now think about it. He was raised there in a carpenter shop. I'm sure that at the close of the day, he was tired like you get tired and I get tired and we get tired. Uh, I'm sure that the Lord Jesus, and we, we never seem to put this together, but he learned, no doubt, because that was a characteristic of Jewish children, they had to learn the trade are the trades of their father. And I can see the Lord Jesus there in the carpenter shop in Nazareth as uh, his father taught him how to make furniture. 
He probably made uh, chairs or tables or he probably made uh, all different types of furniture in the house and things outside of the house. And it was a daily chore for him to learn the trade and then to apply the trade and then he was busy in the trade. And so up and down the streets of Nazareth, the Lord Jesus would travel and the people would come to know him and come to know Joseph and come to know Mary. So for a good part of his life, he lived in this city. And that's the reason they identified him as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, that'd be like you being identified with the town you came from. Uh, I'm from over in, uh, of course, Yadkin County, and I'm from a little town called Courtney. And I've had multitudes of people through the years to ask me where I'm from, and I tell them. And they don't know any more then than they did before I told them. Because uh, most people have never heard of Courtney. Uh, if you're driving down 601 out of the Adkinville and you sneeze, you've done gone by it. It's just a hole in the road. Uh, years ago, they decided to put a, a stoplight up, and uh, they had so many wrecks because to put the stoplight up, they had to take it down. Uh, they couldn't function with a stoplight. And uh, it's just not that well known. Now, some people that are raised around Yadkinville and Moxville, they'll know a little bit about Courtney. But uh, Courtney is kind of uh, an out of the way place. And uh, what really gets people is when I tell them that I was raised in Courtney next to Chinky Pen. And uh, that really identifies where I came from uh, Chinky Pen. So uh, that's where I'm from. Now, Jesus was from Nazareth, uh, a town, a small town, a small dwelling place. Now, notice, if you will, and this is what's so vitally important about the town Jesus was raised in. Notice that there's a prophetic word about his birth in our text verse. The Bible said that uh, it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, I want us to examine that phrase for just a moment. It's a very interesting phrase. There was a prophet that prophesied that Jesus would be called a Nazarene because he would be uh, spend most of his life in the city and the little town of Nazareth. Now, it's very interesting if you try to go into the Old Testament Scriptures and find that prophecy where the prophet said that he would be called a Nazarene, you will not find it back there. It was a saying in the days of Christ. But it doesn't mean that that prophecy wasn't given. Somewhere back there, God spoke to a prophet. And most people believe that this prophecy is a prophecy that we find in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was one of those great prophetic characters in the Old Testament Scriptures. And I want you to turn back there for just a moment to the book of Isaiah, and there is a kinship here about Nazareth where our Lord was raised. Turn in your Bibles in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah. It's page number 723, if you have a Schofield reference Bible. And uh, I want you to follow me for just a moment in the 11th chapter. I believe we can find Nazareth here in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 1. Now, I want you to notice that Isaiah had much to say about the future. We call it prophecy. Isaiah chapter number 53, we have uh, the, the great chapter about the coming and the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the chapter that the uh, Ethiopian eunuch was reading when Philip came and joined himself to his chariot. He was reading Isaiah 53, and he raised the question, of whom uh, does the prophet speak of himself or of someone else? And the Bible said that Philip got up in the chariot uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch, and he preached unto him Jesus out of Isaiah chapter number 53. Now, Isaiah is going to take us beyond the cross. He's going to take us all of the way to the resurrection. 
Isaiah is going to take us all the way of prophetically in the future as it pertains to us into the millennium. And we're going to see some of that here in just a moment by way of introduction. But I want you to notice with me, very interesting, in the 11th chapter of the book of Isaiah, he is talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in Isaiah chapter 11, and notice verse number 1. The Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now let's analyze that verse for just a moment because I'm going to show you where Nazareth is found in this verse of Scripture. Now he's talking about uh, the coming Lord, the coming Messiah. And he's comparing him to a stump that's been cut down and a shoot, a branch, is coming up out of the stump. And he's compared in the previous chapter, he has compared Uh, the nations of the world to trees that are cut down, evil nations. For instance, look with me in uh, verse number 33 of uh, Isaiah chapter number 10. He said, Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bow of terror and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down. There's a phrase to cutting down a tree. And the haughty shall be humbled. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. And Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. Now again, I want you to get the picture so it can all come into focus. We're going somewhere with this in just a moment. He's comparing the enemy nations to a forest of trees that have got self-sufficient away from the Lord against God And God is going to hew them down, just like you take today a chainsaw and cut a tree down. God is going to hew them down to the extent all that's going to be left is a stump in the ground. The trees are going to be cut. And many times uh, when we cut down the trees, uh, uh, we look at the stump. We say, well, you know, that'll probably rot out. There won't be another tree there. But God said through Isaiah that out of one of these trees that's cut down, there's going to come forth a twig, and that twig is going to become a branch, and it's going to become a great tree. Now let's look at it in verse number 1. There shall come forth, first of all, a rod. Now if you take notes in your Bible, that's a word which means a little twig. There's going to come forth a little twig. Now notice this, out of the stem of Jesse. The word stem there is a reference to a stump. So here you've seen trees cut down and a little old sprout come out of them. Well, Isaiah is prophetically speaking here that out of Jesse, now that was the father, of course, of David, and out of uh, David's genealogy, uh, something great is going to happen. You remember uh, Nathan went down there one day and God told him to go anoint a prophet uh, for for the, the nation of Israel. And all of the sons came by, and, and the prophet of God said, No, no, you got anyone left? And he said, Well, there's a little old redheaded boy over here, but uh, he's out there tending the sheep. And the prophet said, Send him in. And when the little old Rudy David got over there, God's man said, That's him. Let's anoint him. He's going to be the next king of Israel. Now here's the prophecy. These other nations are gone. Verse 1, chapter 11. There's going to come forth a twig out of the stem, out of the root of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now I want you to look with me at the word branch. It's a very interesting word in its Hebrew connotation. It is the word nester. Let me spell it for you. N-E-T-S-E-R. Out of the branch comes nester. Let me tell you what the word nester means. The word nester is the same word Nazarene. Now that ought to encourage you. That ought to help you feel good about this. Because in Isaiah chapter number 11, uh, all the other evil nations are going to be cut down like stumps. Here's going to come a little old sprout. And then out of the stem, out of the root of Jesse, and it's going to turn into a branch, a nester. And uh, what's going to happen when this Nazarene, this nester, what's going to happen eventually to uh, this individual that's coming through the line of Jesse 
and becoming the huge tree. Well, I'm so glad you asked because look in the same chapter. Look with me, please, in verse number 6. Here's what's going to happen when he comes down here and takes over. The Bible said that the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Now, if you know anything about uh, animals, you know that don't happen today. I'll tell you what does happen today. The wolf uh, has, uh, puts a napkin around his uh, neck and has the lamb for lunch. That's what happens today because of ferocity of the animal kingdom uh, and preying upon one another. And uh, if you put a, if you put a uh, wolf and uh, you, put a, uh, you put a lamb together, the wolf uh, is going to have uh, lamb for lunch. And the leper, leopard shall lie down with the kid. That's with the goat. A leper is going to lay down with the goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, how's that going to come about? Because out of the stump of Jesse is going to come a little sprout that's going to come a branch, and it's going to become a Nazarene. It's the word, very word Nazarene. That's the closest you're going to find this prophecy in Matthew 2 in the Old Testament scriptures, but that's close enough because we can see that the Nazarene that he's talking about coming out of this branch is going to take over down here, and he won't be a Republican, and he won't be a Democrat, and he won't be an Independent. Uh, uh, he's going to come and set up his kingdom, uh, and he won't even have to be voted on because he's already in, uh, and he's going, to, he's going to rule, he's going to reign, and wh when he does that, uh, the Bible said that the cat, verse 7, that the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice so that the viper's in. Now, look what he says. A suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. That's uh, talking about a, a snake hole like a cobra. You ever seen these people play these trumps, uh, these musical instruments, and that little snake cobra comes up? The only thing that's more stupid than the snake is the person playing the music. I got things around my house to take care of snakes. And I'm sure not going to entertain them with a, with a flute. I might take the flute and hit them in the head, but I'm not going to be blowing it. Because I like snakes. I, I hate snakes. They're, I hate them all. I hate the big ones, the little ones, the dead ones, the live ones. I don't care what color they are. I, I have people to tell me, well, you don't need to hurt black snakes, but don't get in my way, and I won't. A snake is a snake to me. Somebody says, well, they keep the rats away. Well, there's, there's cats around. Uh, somebody says, well, they'll, uh, they'll, uh, they'll, a lot of the other things won't, I don't care. I can go to the hardware store and I can buy all kinds of spray. I can take care of that. Just keep the snake away from me. I told you uh, years ago, I was delivering a death notification for the police department one night. Man, I'll never forget this. They called me, I think it was around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. A man's girlfriend on Business 40 was walking uh, near Broad Street, downtown Winston-Salem, stepped out in front of the car and got killed. And they asked me to go deliver the death notification. And it wasn't far from here, back over here off of Union Cross Road. And I think I got there around 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning knocked on the door, and this guy came to the door, and I'm standing there making conversation with him, and I'm sharing with him the grief that he's about to bear and trying to counsel with him, pray with him, and help him. And, and I'm just about, I don't know, eight, ten feet inside the front door. And while I'm talking to him, I'm just kind of looking around, and I happen to look, and he overhears a table, and underneath the table, there's a, a large glass aquarium and it's got a top on it, and the top's half off. And uh, I just to make conversation with him, tried to get his mind occupied and moving on to other things. I said, so you got an aquarium over there? I guess you like to uh, keep fish. Oh, he said, no, no, I, I don't keep fish. He said, uh, I keep snakes. And he said, I've got a snake in there. And he started looking around like that. He said, that thing's got out. He's somewhere here in the house. Well, I start looking. I want to help him find it. (laughs) 
I finished up hurriedly. And you, you heard Jesus say, watch and pray. Uh, I watched and prayed. And it was time to move home. I don't understand that mentality. Uh, you know, some of the temples you find in, uh, in the New Testament that was in some Pergamos, in one of the seven churches of Revelation, they have this huge temple. They're close to Pergamos. And in that temple, they had uh, these, uh, these medical facilities. And as a matter of fact, if you'll notice on the back of many of your ambulances and where there's medical facilities, they have a snake, if you've ever noticed that, wrapped around a pole. Well, that's where it had its origin, is in one of the seven churches of Asia Minor, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And what they did, supposedly, to, to heal these people, they would bring them into this huge temple and they would lay around the altar and in the building through and the and the building was full of snakes and they would lay these people sick people and supposedly as the snakes crawled over their bodies through the night some of you are going to go home tonight and look under the bed I'll guarantee you but as they lay around these, uh, this temple, these snakes would come and crawl over their bodies, and supposedly they had healing virtue. And if the snake touched the body, it was supposed to bring healing. Now, I don't know about you. I can go get a shot over to the doctor's office. I, I can take some Tylenol or some, some Excedrin a lot better than I can lay down somewhere and expect a snake to crawl over me and make me well. If he crawls over me, I may be dead. I may die of a heart attack. The truth of the matter is. Now, I want you to notice that when Jesus comes, uh, we won't have to be afraid of them because their nature is going to be changed when this individual from Nazareth comes back and sets up his kingdom. The ferocity of all of the animal kingdom is going to be tamed. And Romans chapter 8 says that all of creation is now groaning and travailing in pain, awaiting to be delivered. Even creation itself wants to be delivered from this curse that's upon this world. So here we find the Lord Jesus, the branch, the Netz, Netzer, who is the Nazarene. Now turn back in your Bibles for just a moment to the book of Mark. I want you to notice with me in the first chapter of the book of Mark, we have Jesus of Nazareth again. Now that phrase is used numerous times in the New Testament. But I want you to notice, if you will, that this name has power associated with it. Because in the book of Mark, chapter number 1, Notice with me verse number 24, and there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now when the Bible says that a man has an unclean spirit, that means that he is demon possessed. The devils have taken up housekeeping down in his soul. And the Lord confronts this man in verse 24, and notice what they said, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Look at this, look at what the devils call him. Thou Jesus, notice here's the phrase, thou Jesus of Nazareth. Now there's, there's the phrase again attached to his name. Thou Jesus of Nazareth. Now why is that so? Now I'm sure you scholars know this. But there were other people, in fact you can find them in the, in the New Testament. They're named. There was other people in the days of Jesus, sojourn here on this earth, who were likewise named Jesus. That was a name that other people used. So what are, what are the demons saying? Yeah, there, there's, some, there's some other people around here that call themselves Jesus. But we know you're different than all of the rest of them because we know 
that you are the Jesus of Nazareth, uh, and this Jesus of Nazareth uh, was different than, uh, hey, wait a minute, they wasn't afraid of all of those others called Jesus, uh, but this Jesus of Nazareth had put the fright of eternity in them because they knew him. As a matter of fact, in the book of Mark chapter 5, when the man there who is demon-possessed uh, uh, meets Jesus one day, the Bible said uh, that he lived among the tombs, he had no clothes on his body, uh, and uh, Jesus came by, cast the demons out of him, uh, and as he's confronting those demons, those demons said to Jesus, the son of Nazareth, uh, said, Art thou come to torment us before our time? The demons out of hell know that the Jesus of Nazareth is the Jesus uh, that's going to eventually put them in the lake of fire, and they're going to burn forever and ever. They're not afraid of these other Jesuses. They're not afraid of the Jesus of the Mormons or the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, but they're afraid of the Jesus we know because he's the living Jesus, the son of the living God, and the devil step up and take notice when King Jesus shows up. I'm glad it's that way. I'm glad the devils of hell know who my Savior is, and I'm not ashamed of that. Well, I'll tell you something. I've, I've never seen anything happening. I had a, uh, had a preacher friend to tell me uh, this week that a independent, temperamental Baptist church, and it's a large church, and I know, I know where the church is located. I actually serve on the North Carolina Christian School Association board, and one of the men <clears throat> that's on the board I serve on heads up a portion of that ministry. It's a large, it's a large ministry. It's down towards the eastern part of the state. And he said, preacher, you'll never believe what they've just done. I said, nothing surprises me anymore, but tell me. He said, they have just dropped all of their missionaries hear me well, they have just dropped all of their missionaries that use only the King James Bible. And then he said, secondly, they, may, they are making fun of any church that endorses now the King James Bible. And this preacher told me that his father attended a sporting event where that church and his church had come together and as the preacher was leaving the game, they didn't recognize the preacher. And he heard some of the members of that church say as he walked by, well, the, and he called that preacher's church, well, those people over there at that church, they're ignorant and unlearned because they believe the Word of God's in the King James Version. I, I, I told that preacher, I'm good money to get up Sunday and preach a message on I'm ignorant and proud of it. If you want to call me ignorant for believing I have the Word of God in front of me, help yourself. Now, that's, that's the spirit of this age. Just like the demons when they were in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They recognized the fake from the real. And I've had uh, some head-to-head -head combat with that guy in some of our meetings. We actually had a school here in North Carolina that raised money for their school and they put this banquet together and they advertised it and I couldn't believe it when a friend of mine told me, I went out on the internet and sure enough had the name of the Christian school up here and talked about the banquet they're having to raise money for the Christian school and down at the bottom of the page, it talked about the different types of alcoholic beverages you could purchase at the banquet on behalf of the Christian school. And we got in our meeting and we said, fee, fi, fo, fum, I don't think so. And this same individual tried to justify alcoholic consumption. 
You know, folks like that, the problem is they just need to get saved. When you get saved, you, 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 don't, look for, you don't look for Bud. You look for Jesus. That's a good statement. You're welcome. He makes a difference in your life. And I want, I want you to notice something. In the book of John, the first chapter, there's a story of Nathaniel and Nazareth. Would you turn there? I'd rather than quote it, I'd rather you see it. It'll mean more to you in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter number one. I want you to notice this. This is powerful. And this is what everybody needs to be about. And Shane's announced it here just a little while ago, tomorrow night's soul winning. And uh, whether we're going tomorrow night or through the day, hand out a tract, tell somebody about Jesus. That's our job. And I want you to notice with me in John chapter number one, verse number 40. One of the uh, two which heard John speak and followed him was uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, what happened when Andrew met Jesus? He got concerned about his brother. I believe saved people are concerned about unsaved people. And then in verse 41, notice he first find him. Now, look at the word first. After, after, he, after Andrew met the Lord, notice what happened. He got his priorities right immediately. He said, the first thing I want to do is to go get my lost brother. Now hear me well. He had no idea when he was first of all finding his brother and going to introduce him to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He had absolutely no idea whatsoever that in just a few short years, uh, this person that he's about to introduce to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, will be the one called upon to stand up in Acts chapter 2 and preach that great message on the day of Pentecost and see 3,000 souls saved. Uh, and it will happen because here was a saved brother that got concerned about his unsaved brother uh, and he brought him to Jesus and old Peter got saved and Jesus said, Thou art Peter. Uh, in, in Matthew, he talks about this. He said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, talking about himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Andrew, uh, notice, he finds his own brother. But notice something happens here in verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he findeth Philip. Now he said unto Philip, follow me. And Philip was a Bethesda, Bethesda uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now notice what Philip did. Philip findeth Nathanael. Now so far as we know, this Nathanael is a friend. Andrew finds his kin. He finds his brother. But Philip finds a friend which says that's our job. We, we, we witness to her family. We witness to her friend. Let me tell you something. You'll be glad you did if, if they die and you come around looking in the casket. You'll be thankful that you've told them about Jesus. And notice Philip, uh, 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 verse 45, findeth Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Look at here. Who did we find? Jesus of Nazareth. You see that? He's called Jesus of Nazareth. Now, once again, here we find the town in which Jesus was from. But watch the question. Very important. Verse number 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Philip, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, you come and see. Yeah, there's something good going to come out of Nazareth. What's going to come out of Nazareth is going to be the Savior of the world. Now, the question is, why in the world did Nathaniel raise the question? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? This is the town Jesus was raised in. This is the town he worked in. Uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Why did he raise that question? Because 
historically, as we look back, Nazareth, the entire city, was not the type of city you would want to take your family to on vacation. Nazareth was a despised and rejected place. You know what people said in that day? In that day, when, when people rejected a person, a place, or a thing, they had a little symbolic thing they went through. If the name of Nazareth was mentioned, they would spit on the ground when they mentioned it. In other words, they believed that it was so low down and so sinful and such a red light district and such a out of the way place that no decent person would want to go to, it became a byword in that day. And when they would mention the name Nazareth, they would follow it by spitting on the ground in detesting the, the place where Jesus was raised. It was a place where there was a mixed population of Jews and Gentiles. And if you know anything, Jews and Gentiles had nothing whatsoever to do with each other. Rebels, rebels. It was a stronghold of rebels who lived there. And uh, if you would talk about Nazareth, here's what you'd say. That's the city on the other side of the tracks. That's the city that is a red light district. That is the place you don't want your children to go. That is the place you don't want your family to go. That's not a place you even want to go near because it is a sinful city. It's a small town in the days of Jesus, but it was a town of renown as far as being a sinful place. That's the reason when Philip said to Nathaniel, we have found Jesus of Nazareth, he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth. Why did he say that? Because nothing good had ever come out of Nazareth. There, there's never been any person of uh, renown. There had never uh, been a general. There had never been a political leader. There had never been anyone who had, uh, who had ever done anything, ever accomplished anything worthwhile coming out of this out and out place called Nazareth. Uh, oh, but I've got good news for you tonight. Uh, that changed when Jesus Christ came through because Jesus Christ was God incarnate in flesh uh, and they talk about Jesus of Nazareth because Jesus put Nazareth on the map. Now we'll say three things about it right quick and we're going. First of all, I believe that this city, Nazareth, I believe it speaks to the grace of God. Let me tell you why I say that. When Jesus showed up on planet earth, he didn't show up in Jerusalem. You ever thought about it? You ever thought about it? Ever raised the question, why didn't he, why didn't he, that was the religious capital of the world. That's where the Pharisees stayed. That's where they wore their long robes and long beards and, and carried the scriptures around with them and put them in a little box and put them on their arm and tied them around their forehead and claimed to be so religious. Uh, uh, but when Jesus Christ came, he didn't come into the religious capital of Jerusalem. And let me tell you why. Jesus told us why in other places of Scripture. He said, hey, I didn't come from heaven down here to call the righteous. I came down here to call the sinners under repentance. You know what was going on in Jerusalem? A bunch of self-righteous Pharisees who were as lost as the very word lost is, uh, who were so self-righteous, uh, they rejected the Prince of Glory. And so he didn't go down to Jerusalem uh, because they were religious but lost, and they thought they were okay and going to heaven. Jesus said, I'm going to identify with some people that are hungry and they're looking for some spiritual bread. I think somewhere else he didn't go. He didn't go to the political center of Rome. There's where the prestige was. There's where the great leaders so-called of the political world lived in their palaces and, 
and uh, their servants bowed down to them. And uh, it, Rome was the greatest military uh, city and nation in the world, and people all over the world looked towards Rome for leadership, and they had colonies spread all out across the then known world. If you remember down by the riverside, uh, uh, there was a seller of Lydia, the seller of purple. The Bible said that she was from Philippi, and then it says this, a colony of Rome. Rome set up these little colonies, and they would even set up these little temples around uh, for people to worship in. Uh, as long as they gave their final worship to the emperors of Rome, because they set themselves up as being the gods of that era, and when Jesus came, he didn't go to the religious capital of Jerusalem. When Jesus came, he didn't go to the political capital, capital of Rome. Jesus came to identify himself with sinners. You'd better be glad he did that. You know what? You can get a sinner saved much quicker than you can get a religious but lost person saved. Because people who are lost think they're okay and they're self-righteous. But when a sinner acknowledges that he is a sinner and he can't do anything about his sin, and he'll come to Jesus, there's a bomb in Gilead. I'm glad there's a Savior out of Nazareth who went to Nazareth just to say to the world that he identified with the down and outer, and he identified with the sinner, and he identified with the lost person. And the whole world today knows Jesus didn't go to Rome, he didn't go to Jerusalem, and he didn't go over to the Greeks and their philosophical culture uh, of big things and big wigs, Jesus went down to Nazareth to identify with the out and out and down and down sinner. Amen. I'm glad he identifies with sinners, aren't you? Because if you're saved tonight, he came by one day and you realize you was a sinner and you got in. Thank God for that. Now I'll say this, and I'm finished. Jesus Jesus exalted the city of Nazareth. Let me tell you how he done it. This is interesting. I never noticed this till recently. Isn't it amazing? I've studied this book extensively for over 50 years, and I'm still learning so many things in here that I've never seen before. I'm so excited. I can't hardly wait till I get back in and learn something else. Isn't it amazing how great this book is? Jesus exalted the city of Nazareth. First of all, he exalted the city of Nazareth in his death. Do you remember when they put Jesus on the cross? Do you remember the inscription that was put over his head? Do you remember what they, you remember what they said to Pilate? It said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. What did they put over the cross? That he was from Nazareth. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. They, they said, Pilate, you put up there that he said he was the king of the Jews. Uh, I think Pilate got in on it a little bit, but he was too, too prideish to really get all the way in. But he said, what I've written, I've written. So over the head of Jesus, it was known. It was not one of those other persons named Jesus. This one on the cross was the one that was down there in Nazareth, and he's the branch out of the root of Jesse that's going to turn everything around before it's over and fix a way for us to get out of here and get to the right direction. But do you know the message of the empty tomb was a message of Jesus of Nazareth? Let me give you a scripture. This is interesting. In Mark 16, 6, Mary has come to the tomb and then notice the stones rolled away and they look in and here's an angel on the inside and he said unto them, be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth uh, which was crucified, he's risen, he's not here, behold the place where they laid him. You know what the, the angel said? <laughs> not only... Not only is this name over the head of Jesus the right name because he's the king, uh, but this Jesus is getting up out of the tomb. He's the Jesus that was raised down there in Nazareth. Uh, he's that branch out of the stem of Jesse. Amen. But lastly, 
Up in heaven tonight, Jesus is still identified as the Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to what the Bible says. Paul's giving his testimony before the religious zealots of his day. In Acts chapter number 22 and verse number 8, Paul's testimony, he said, when Jesus struck him down on the Damascus road, and I answered, Who art thou, Lord? Acts 22, 8, And he, Jesus, said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Saul, I want you to know, there's some other people running around here by the name of Jesus. I just want you to know who I am. I'm the one that was raised down there in Nazareth. Mary was my mother. Joseph was my stepfather. And I just want you to know I worked in the carpenter shop, but I'm up here in heaven now, and I'm still in the carpentry business. I, I'm building you a mansion right now, and it's going to be ready for you when you arrive. You know what the early church was called? Let me tell you what they were called. The Bible says that they called them, in Acts chapter 24, in verse number 5, a sect of the Nazarenes. Where do you suppose they got that from? From their leader? They accused Paul of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus took a town that was not known and made it well known. And there's so many other times I could take that phrase, uh, Jesus the Nazarene, and share it with you out of the Bible. Seven times in the book of Acts you find that phrase. So it's an important phrase. Jesus, the Nazarene. Aren't you glad tonight if you're saved that Jesus walked out of Nazareth and became the Savior of the world? Aren't you glad tonight if you've got lost loved ones who've never been saved that there is a Savior that walked out of Nazareth and went back up to Jerusalem and walked out of Jerusalem up on that hill of the skull, a place called Calvary, struck out his arms <laughs> and said, "'Tis done, tis done. It is finished. Uh, don't need any more lambs over to the temple there in Jerusalem. You don't need the veil anymore. Just rip it down because now you can go into the very presence of God through my body, Jesus is saying." I become your propitiation. I will represent you. I will be your attorney before the Father of glory. Just seek my face. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Jesus said, I'll save you. I'll look after you. I'll help you. Thank God for Jesus of Nazareth. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I wonder if you're here tonight. You know, there's always a possibility. Always a possibility. I've seen this happen many times down through the years. When someone would come to the conclusion all of a sudden, as the Spirit of God began to deal with them through the Word of God, Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I need to get it settled. Maybe you're here tonight. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God has been churning your soul even before you came in this auditorium this evening. Maybe you're here tonight while I've been preaching and the Spirit of God's been churning your heart about your salvation, whether or not you're really saved. I kind of feel like that may be the case. The Spirit of God wouldn't let me to see it. If you're here tonight, you don't want to play Russian roulette with your soul and take a chance on dying going to hell forever. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by tonight. He'll forgive you and he'll save you. 
And if you're here tonight saved and you find yourself in a foreign country, you ought to get out of that country and get around this altar and say, Lord, I'm coming home tonight. I am not going to leave out of this building in a foreign country. I'm coming home tonight. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder if there's someone here tonight. You'd say by an upraised hand, preacher, I want you to pray for me. God spoke to me about some things. Just lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Others. Others. Heavenly Father, I sure love you tonight. Thank you so very much for becoming our Nazarene, our Savior, the branch out of the stump to save the world that will believe on you. There's others that need to get around this altar tonight. Help them to do so. Thank you that you are our sufficiency in salvation. You're our sufficiency in service. And I pray you'll help us this evening. Speak to us. And then as you speak, help us to have enough common sense to hear and to listen and to respond in Jesus' name. Sing this stanza. If others need to come, would you slip out and come right now while we sing? He sings this stanza. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my being's ransomed powers. All my thoughts and words and doings. All my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my days and all she plays one stanza. If anyone else needs to come, would you come? We'll be going here just in a moment. 